Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jackie Werns, and I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first webinar in our online symposium, Wrapping Up, Taking Stock, and Moving Forward, the New Reality for K-12 Education. As many of you know, over the past seven weeks, we have answered your questions about the impact of coronavirus or COVID-19 and school closures on Illinois schools through our weekly webinars. As the end of the school year nears, however, we know you need a clear roadmap on how to wrap up the current school year, take stock of the educational landscape, and plan for moving forward to provide continuity of education to students during the 2020-2021 school year, whether that be in person or on virtual online or some mix of both. So we are offering this webinar symposium to address the legal issues that are essential to successfully closing out this school year and moving on to the next. So today's webinar, the first in our series, is entitled, We've Almost Made It, Wrapping Up an Unconventional School Year. We are going to be discussing the many legal issues with which school leaders are going to be grappling as they shepherd this school year to a close and move on to the summer. So you're going to see we're going to talk today about a number of different topics from grades to graduation, from locker cleanouts to technology returns, from building cleaning to human resources issue, and a number of other things in between. Our hope is that we will give you a roadmap on the legal issues that you need to keep in mind as you're closing out this school year. Um, to begin with, let me welcome our, uh, our team of attorneys here who are gonna be serving on this panel. So in addition to myself, I'm Jackie Gattapur Werns. We have uh, to welcome back a number of faces with which you're probably quite familiar if you've been here with us through the beginning. Uh, we have Shelly Anderson. Hi everyone. Nikki Baser. Good afternoon, everyone. Dana Fattori Crumley. Hi. And Jennifer Smith. Hi. And just so that you know, in the coming weeks, as we go through this symposium, we are going to be having different attorneys and other individuals, so both from inside the firm and out, who are going to be um, addressing the diverse range of legal issues we are covering each week, along with members of our core group of panelists that, that have been with us since the beginning. And a few reminders about just the technology. So please submit your questions through the Q&A function. We aren't able to easily respond to raised hands or to questions submitted through the chat function. So if you can use that Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen, that would be great. We are going to be spending the hopefully last 15 minutes or so of today answering your questions. So if you have any questions related to closing out the school year and what your legal rights and responsibilities are, please submit those to us. Um, any questions we're not able to answer today, we will attempt to get to in the coming weeks. And as always, check out our website at fransic.com for more insights on COVID-19 and other education law issues, and reach out to us if we can help you in any way. Okay, so jumping right in. One of the issues that has been gaining a lot of airtime recently relates to grading. So although we've known since ISBE's March 27th, 2020 guidance that ISBE has said student work completed during the suspension of in-person learning uh, should not negatively impact a student's grades or otherwise impact a student's academic standing, but as schools and school districts have figured out how to balance that prohibition with the real need to keep students engaged during remote learning, many questions have continued to surface. So Nikki, what options are available to schools and how are they handling this delicate balance and what legal concerns do they need to be thinking about? Sure, yeah, Jackie, I mean, I think this is a really hard one and we don't, obviously, as the ISB guidance gives us, we don't want to negatively impact students who are struggling because of technology, because the remote learning is just, is really hard, um, as we all know. Um, so as you had mentioned, ISB's guidance has been clear from the beginning. You can't have a grade that negatively impacts a student. Um, so I think, you know, 
ISB came out, when they came out with their longer remote learning guidance or recommendations, they also included a lot of information about grading. So I, I would encourage districts to review that if they're still struggling with their grading plans. Um, I think, you know, clearly one of the things that ISB is recommending and one of the things that we're seeing a lot of districts do to try to balance this is to come up with a system where students um, who are doing better do receive a grade, a letter grade, particularly at the high school level that can be very important for students in their GPA. Um, for students who are seeing a decrease in, in their grade, a lot of districts are then giving students passes rather than, you know, obviously if they got an A earlier in the year and now they're getting a B, pursuant to ISB guidance, they shouldn't be giving out that B, so they're, they're looking to a pass. And then the last thing that school districts are doing to avoid failing students is to give them an incomplete um, rather than a, an F grade. Um, and you know we're seeing that across the board, both elementary and high schools. So can I just ask you though, I'm just, I'm sorry, Dana, I'm just so curious. I mean, what, what happens then if they get the incomplete, what happens to them with respect to that they're that school year or the next school year, what's the impact of that? Yeah, sure. And, and that's something that ISBE has also weighed in on in their recommendations. Um, the idea is that you would enable that student to make up that work at some point. We'll talk about summer school a little bit later. ISBE's guidance on summer school has reinforced this, which is summer school is definitely an opportunity to try to make back that work um, in some way or to wait until we're back in school next school year. Um, the idea being that at some point that incomplete can be turned into at, at minimum a pass. Obviously super essential for seniors who are poised to graduate if they are going to get an incomplete working with them and if if not then then allowing a, a time during the summer for credit recovery so i mean i i was going to say you w with the incompletes i think this is something that jennifer and i have a lot of experience with in the special ed realm because oftentimes we'll have students that are either going through some difficulties or in the process of a special ed evaluation and maybe just not doing work for one reason or another and certainly we have a lot of students in that boat now with the remote learning and you want to make sure that you're not biting off more than you can chew people yeah. are gonna, there's going to be a whole new crop of kindergartners next year that for high school districts there'll be a whole new crop of freshmen um we need to i understand giving the incompletes to sort of track who may be um lagging behind and certain skills that are necessary to move on to the next grade but you need to remember there are other tools to do that and we also want to remember the spirit of this, which is not to penalize kids who may be having difficulty logging on. So you couldn't log on. Now you're going to do all the work that everybody did who could log on when you come back. That is not the purpose. That's not the spirit of it. So remember, there's things that you can do. There are formative assessments that you can give in the beginning of a school year to sort of really see where students at and see what they can give. Um, but I also wanted to shift and Jennifer talk a little bit because I know we've had questions about this is for grading is for all students, but for special ed students, progress monitoring, what are the expectations around that? And what are the questions and the answers that we have right now? Yeah, so on progress monitoring, so special education students are entitled to get um, feedback on their performance this at the same point when gen, general education students get grades. So you, if you're for IEP students, they need to get grades that everyone gets plus progress reports, and that is on their goals and their IEP. Now, a real challenge is usually the IEP sets out, that has to be based on data of your tracking their performance on goals. And that's usually the basis for reporting on progress. And a lot of times those are, are chunked. Uh, an annual goal um, is chunked into benchmarks or objectives, and you might be which often align with grading periods. So you might have a fourth quarter objective that you're reporting out. All that to say, a lot of, I'm getting questions where we don't have data on objectives, we don't have data at all. Uh, what do we put on the progress report? I mean, the first thing that's most important is do report something. Right. So, because you have to report on annual goals. So even if it's, here's where they were when we went to remote learning, here's some narrative about what we know their progress is now, at least that would meet in some sense the obligation. The, the technical obligation is to report on goals, not on um, necessarily the benchmarks and objectives. So you wanna give some report on the goals, whatever you can come up with. 
Um, obviously, the gold standard would be to still try to gather some sort of data, but if you can't, come up with something. And I think, I think that's the key thing, is that you have to really sit, and this sort of reminds me of back being a teacher, and I would assign something and people would come up and say, I can't do this. And that's always the first reaction when we have to do something new. And I, I know that teachers are struggling, but I'm thinking about a lot of the goals that I see frequently on IEP, and it might be write a paragraph. I, there's really not a lot of reasons right now why we couldn't. I mean, we could all write a paragraph together right now. Jackie could share a Word document, and I could have Jennifer write a five-sentence paragraph with a topic sentence, and at the end, we could all use our question in A to say, did she meet the goal of like a topic sentence and three supporting sentences? So there are still a lot of things you can do with technology. And I think in as long as you can document somewhere, at, like this is what we've decided to do. If there's a goal that really can't be monitored, I think that's opportunity to write some narrative and about how you considered and you know what you ended up doing and how you're gonna address that when you get back. Okay, so, oh. Yeah, just with that, Jackie, I, I wondered if we wanted to move on to. Uh... Yeah, sure. So another issue we've been hearing a lot about relates to students who are absent from school now that campuses are shut down. And, um, you know, for instance, we just, I just reviewed an article from Orlando where it was describing that uh, in Orange County, the average daily attendance there has dropped from about 86% in February to about 80% in April. And there are nearly 3,000 students who are, as they described it, missing in action, meaning they have done no work since distance learning began in mid-March. And the impact of students who are disengaged from remote learning will unquestionably be significant. And so Dana, I, I was hoping that you could talk to us about what those concerns are and how schools should act now to mitigate the risks that may result if students are missing in action for too long. Right, and I think this is something that we talked about maybe at, at one point is how many times do we contact people who are really disengaged um, and are not participating. Um, and I, I think we you know, have discussed that we need to keep, document that we've contacted them and that we've offered the services, but then if they don't engage in them, um, you know, I think Nikki can talk to a little bit about how that affects their attendance in general and what, st what, they, what you're recording for attendance. Um, but I think just continued efforts to re-engage maybe there it's done for this year but we might be in the same boat next year of how we're going to get these kids engaged and starting to think about a plan for that now but nikki why don't you tell us a little bit about attendance yeah no i, I think that's right dana you know it's interesting so isby just came out with more guidance this week on attendance again sort of stressing the fact that um it's really attendance the purpose of it right now is to account for the learning day keeping students engaged everything that we're talking about here um they sort of note that one-to-one -one you know, check-ins with teachers is preferred, but the guidance offers a number of ways that um, the districts can keep an eye on attendance. You know, even for example, if you have a weekly packet turn in, if a student turns in a packet for that week, then every day that that packet covers, they would be marked as present. What I think is really interesting about the ISB guidance, um, is particularly pertaining to the conversation that we're having about sort of these students that are missing in action, is that there is a reference to the truancy law um, in the new ISB guidance and, you know, that that should be utilized when necessary. Um, you know, even, even before remote learning, it's not something that we typically um, encourage districts to go down that path unless there's really no other alternative. I think if anybody has students that are just, you know, that they can't find that are chronically not engaging in the remote learning, uh, certainly talk with us, cer certainly talk with your council before you go the route of, of the truancy laws. I think that's a really drastic measure right now. Um, again, might be necessary, but um, as, you, as you said, Dana, I think what we're really looking at here is trying to 
find any way in for engagement, you know, utilize your coaches if those are the people that have better connections, utilize your social workers, utilize your counselors, whomever you have at your disposal, even sometimes the, the, the school secretary or clerk is the person that everybody knows, maybe they're the person to reach out. So um, I do everything you can before you even consider sort of the truancy path. Agreed. So the other thing that we're seeing is, um, uh, we've started to have uh, parents attorneys reach out and say, you know, on behalf of families, you know, remote learning is really not working for our child. And ironically, while the therapeutic day schools are mostly remote, I don't know of any that are in person, the residential schools are open. And so we're starting to get the odd situation of especially students at that therapeutic day level or pretty significant uh, support in a gen ed school saying, you know, remote learning's not working, we need to look at residential because we know that would be in person. Um, that is really a, a, a really concerning trend. Um, and I, I had an IEP meeting where that was the issue yesterday. I think, you know, we can't, in special ed, you can't ever say just a flat no, like the reason you're saying remote you're, the reason you're saying remote, uh, residential is needed is remote learning, so we're not even going to talk about it. You really do have to tease into, okay, what's going on? What's not working? Is it something specific to the disability, or is it the same frustration all of our students experience, are experiencing? We're obviously not going to send all of Illinois to Utah right now, um, but it, it's certainly something that we're starting to get those requests. So I, I wanted to flag that issue and it's around the disengagement. And I think that that's where we really do need to, I mean, the way out of sort of any uh, snafu in under idea in my mind is to really put your thinking cap on and brainstorm and think creatively and try different things. It is a trial and error and, and the error so much doesn't matter. It's the trial. I mean, event, the, eventually we don't want to err forever. We want to get to a point. But you do need to remember that there are some students that either because of the se severity of their disabilities or because of where they are in that moment, like you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But that doesn't excuse the school district from trying to be creative. And I think the solution that you came up with yesterday, Jennifer, was really creative. I think you should share that. I, I think that this is the one where we said, okay, um, do you have any extra, was this extra paras? Let's do, then let's just have a day long, the para is on the screen all day and can literally walk the student through instruction all day long. And um, as you have some staff that maybe aren't doing other things, you know, at least like Dana said, we're going to ramp up. We're going to try something different. So let's try, you know, a one-to-one -one para virtually and see how that goes. Possibly won't go well, but you never know. But it's, you put something on the record that you're trying to meet the student's needs, which is the key thing. Exactly. Okay, so another issue we've been thinking about a lot, graduation is right around the corner. And luckily for graduating seniors, Governor J.B. Pritzker issued an executive order in late April relaxing a wide number of graduation requirements impacting schools. And this was essential for allowing students to graduate. Shelley, we know the rules are relaxed. Can you give us a quick rundown of what that means for schools as they prepare to have seniors graduate. Sure, and it's not only seniors, it's also eighth graders. And for many of you out there probably know I have an eighth grader. Um, so the one thing that they've done for eighth graders is suspend the Illinois Constitution test, which my son had already taken. It's probably already been done at many eighth, grader, eighth grade schools. Um, but in terms of the seniors, they've also suspended a number of the requirements related to consumer ed, five day PE. There's some proficiency examinations related to foreign uh, language that have been suspended state assessments, the constitution tests, there's a whole litany of, of pieces that they have said that seniors no longer have to satisfy in order to get their diplomas. Um, I would say that the, the one piece of that is that it certainly is going to help our seniors not have to be looking to um, fulfill some of those requirements over the summer, which obviously would have been the alternative, but just to, some you know, guidance out to everyone listening is to make sure that your board policy doesn't specifically mandate what those requirements are as well, because you don't want any confusion 
over whether or not, even though they've met the state requirements, have they somehow not met your district requirements related to graduation and receiving a diploma? So there's some quick action you can take with respect to suspending that portion of your board policy just for this school year to make sure that it complies with what the current rules are from the state. Now, another uh, graduation related issue, those of you who follow our alerts know that there was quite the saga last week about graduation ceremonies. So at first, is we took the position that in-person graduation ceremonies of any kind were not allowed to take place even if social distancing occurred. Shelly, can you tell us uh, what are the rules now and what do schools need to keep in mind as they're planning graduation events? Sure, and just to kind of reflect back on kind of where we went and how quickly things are changing, and this is just yet another example of what's happening, is that you know we had before the the day before our last webinar um, on that Wednesday we had the rule come out from ISB saying that there could be no um, in-person graduation ceremonies and it seemed to be directly related to publicity that was out there with respect to certain Illinois school districts that were planning creative graduation ceremonies um, related to drive-through or having kind of a by appointment, having a small number of kids, because the guidance specifically addressed those two pieces. Um, the following day, we had uh, social media come out with ISB saying that they were looking at that, they were considering making some changes. The next day, they said, yes, they're still thinking of making some changes. And then I think it was on May 2nd, um, we came out with, they came out with the actual guidance related to what is required. And I think they got a lot of pushback from districts who had spent a lot of time and energy finding ways to celebrate their seniors, and many of whom, at least those that we talked to, um, were being very respectful of social distancing. So the pushback was not, let us just do this and put kids at risk. It was, we have thought about how, ways to do this that really will protect everyone who's there. And so the guidance that's come out related to what those graduation um, ceremonies can look like now, I think really reflects a lot of common sense. And some of them are, you know, you have to make sure that your kids are picking up their diplomas and their uh, cap and gown in advance so they're not getting it from the person that day, making sure that you can provide for actual social distancing when the kids are there, um, that if you have a, you know, drive-through ceremony that anybody who's out of the car has to be wearing a, cap, uh, a mask, that the students have to wear a mask except when they're taking photographs. Um, so there's those types of things. You can't have restroom access, you can't have refreshments available, um, a lot, none of which seem to be in conflict with any of the plans that I have heard from districts already. So it seems doable. Um, we want to say that, you know, well, we certainly talked about this in our last webinar and, and we're proponents of being allowed to celebrate seniors. We really want to make sure that everyone is obviously working hard to determine that you can do this in a safe way for kids, um, which I'm sure, you know, you all are, those of you who are working toward it. So. Yeah, we were really happy to see this um, this easing of the of the restrictions. Um, I did have a super before this came out. I did have a superintendent call me and ask me if he was going to get thrown into jail for this. Um, while we are a full service law firm, we uh, are preferring not to bail our superintendents out of jail. So we are happy that this is <laughs> this is happening in this way. Um, and again, as Shelley said, you know. One thing that I've been really advising is making sure that you send out notification to parents in advance, reminding them that you know, it can get shut down if they don't follow the very strict guide guidelines, if they, you know, if, if they all come or they start getting out of their cars or anything that would put people's safety in jeopardy. So really reinforcing those messages and, and, and working with law enforcement, your local law enforcement, if just to keep things in order can always be helpful. Nikki, what about like virtual graduations where they're going to use photographs and images and maybe, um, you know, videotape or pictures kids that have been taken over the years and then distribute that to parents. Are there any concerns that we need to highlight there? Yeah, absolutely, Dana. It's a great question. You know, just a reminder that when you release, if, if you have, um, many school districts have um, as part of their registration or their enrollment forms, a release for photos and videos and the like. Um, some include this as part of their, what we refer to as directory information. And so what you have to think about there is if there are students or you know, seniors in this case, whose parents have opted out um, either of videos being released or photographs or generally of directory information, <laughs> they would not be, um, they should not be included in those videos. Now, 
I think that this is going to maybe come as news to some parents. Um, we often get this question, as, as a lot of districts know, when they've op parents have opted out and all of a sudden they're not going to be in the yearbook and people get very upset. And so I would definitely um, alert parents to this before you do it because um, and allow them to change their 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 selection. So if someone had opted out, but now they want to opt back in so their kid can be part of the video montage or whatever you're putting out, I would just let let folks give that, give folks that opportunity. I would also just be careful about the kinds of pictures that you include. So um, you know, making sure that you're not identifying students um, in a way that um, you know would violate their their privacy rights. So you know, posting a picture that says, you know, Mrs. Smith's special education class with a picture of all the students, I think would be something you'd want to avoid because you're identifying those students as students in need of special education services. Um, so just, you know, make sure that you're keeping an eye on the pictures that you're releasing um, and that they don't reveal anything um, private about a student that you, you wouldn't want to be revealing, so. Yeah, Nikki, one other, um, just to add to what you're saying, one other scenario that I've had where sharing pictures or broadcasting them so publicly as a problem is um, DCFS guardian, but where the student's still a, under DCFS guardianship. There are times when students are actually, um, their safety is at risk and um, you're, they're, they're hiding the student essentially from someone who would do them harm. So that's probably the most serious concern that I've had is when you, um, I had a district once do a really nice welcoming billboard just showing uh, students in their community intending to be nice, but it advertised that this student who was being hidden from a, an abusive um, uh, custodian lived in that community. So it's a problem. So definitely double check those students. That, that's a real issue. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times video montages are sort of shown at a graduation, but then they just disappear after that. This obviously we're sending out and people will have in their home. So I think a second or third look, just making sure, you know, show it to a couple of different sets of your administrator eyes, just to make sure that there's nothing in there that you think would be would be troubling. And certainly, Jen, the, the scenario that you has to be avoided, so. Now, uh, we are going back to school this year. And we've got a lot of schools that have still very full lockers. So um, they want to get them cleaned out before the summer. What legal considerations should they keep in mind as they're doing this? So this is funny. When um, this slide initially said cleaning out the lockers, and um, I was giving Jackie a hard time that we are probably the least qualified panel to give advice, really practical advice about cleaning out lockers, but she rightfully pointed out, well, there are legal issues here. What if you find, you know, drugs, gun, weapons, your normal contraband in the course? Okay, and I, I said, never mind. I do want to talk about this. This is a good legal topic. So, um, yes, if you find contraband, I mean, a couple things. Um, obviously, your, your school, uh, your school code still applies, so it still could be a violation. Now, in some ways, I was thinking about this, uh, parent, um, parent notification at this point in time is suddenly the ultimate uh, consequence instead of the lower consequence in a real sense, because, you know, sending the student home is, everyone is sent home. So um, right now, instead of expulsion being the worst, I think parent notification is probably the worst that you can do. Uh, our parents are our new dean of students right now. Um, the, the other thing I would say is we've had genuine, genuine safety concerns at times with things found in lockers. So um, even this year before school, we, uh, I was telling the group we had a, a school find a, a gun, uh, a student left in a school in a bag. You know, th there can be, I, I am almost sure someone out there will find something with, with grave safety concerns. So you, first of all, you do have a right. These, there is not an interest in privacy. You can go through these lockers, you can clean them out, you can look in bags if you need to, to ensure safety, and you can take steps, whatever steps you need to, to follow up and ensure their safety, whether that's contacting the police, contacting the parent, it really depends what you find. Okay, so 
As the school year comes to a close, what plans should schools be making for end of year cleaning? Nikki, do you have thoughts on that? Sure, I, I, I realize that this is probably the most exciting topic um, of all time is, is cleaning. Um, I have reacquainted my own self with my, my mop recently, so that's been a very exciting development. Um, you know, we're gonna have an actual webinar. Um, we're gonna have an, a webinar on space issues for the fall and cleaning, and so, you know, and reopening your buildings for the fall. And so, you know, to that end, the CDC and the EPA have come out with a lot of guidance on planning for reopening that might be useful to start reviewing now. And we'll talk more about that in one of our upcoming webinars. Um, you know, if your plan is to do your, your typical cleaning um, that you would do sort of at the end of a school year, um, in terms of like legal issues surrounding the cleaning, there's not a, a huge amount that we have to discuss. I think the real issue is just, you know, is the labor implication. So we do have um, you know, some custodial unions and other custodians who are not in unions pushing back about coming into buildings. And so you know, I think it's very clear um, that it is within the school's authority to have um, employees come to the building. We've talked about this a lot. Um, you know, some folks have had sort of um, skeleton custodial crews, but now they really want their custodians to come back to do that deep cleaning. Um, and you know, I, that's fine. That's acceptable under the governor's order as we read it. Um, just you need to obviously make sure that you are complying with the social distancing. Um, you know, if folks need masks or, or other kinds of protective gear, um, you can think through that. Um, obviously, you want to talk with your unions about it, but, um, you know, working cooperatively to make sure that that happens so that you can get the cleaning done that you need. Um, you know, if you're doing that typical sort of end of the year cleaning, I think is important. Dana, I thought I know that you've had some issues come up though. I had some issues come up with people, when someone um, have actually been exposed. When people have, actually, have been exposed, so we've either had custodians. I think Shelley had this issue too, or construction workers who are working on projects that have been exposed to COVID nineteen, and they've been in the building. Um, you know, whether they've been exposed or whether they've been diagnosed and they were in the building at some amount of time. So I think the first issue is how do you make sure the building is safe to come back? And if you go on the CDC's website, it takes you to the EPA's website and it'll tell you all the cleaning agents that are approved to um, clean an area after there's been an exposure and exactly how to use them. So I think that's a good resource. But then you also have to deal with like, who do you notify, which, um, depending on the level of exposure, there might be notification requirements, certainly not the whole school community because you have not had the whole school community in the building, but um, notification that there's been exposure on a limited basis. I think part of that also that I found was just, if you have someone who's been exposed and you say a custodial worker or someone who's in construction, for instance, would have an even lesser exposure in the building, depending on where they're working, so making sure that you can talk to the construction manager or someone from your department of buildings and grounds to where that person is. So you don't have to go through and you know, reclaim the entire building in that way, but being mindful of where that person likely may have been and making sure that you do the cleaning of those specific areas. Great. So summer school, or sorry, summer is right around the corner and usually that means summer school. Uh, we know from recent guidance from the state that summer school is gonna be virtual. Can you guys tell us what we need to know about that? So who wants to start? There's lots of issues here. Um, I think um, one of the big issues is employment, like who is going to be employed to teach summer school. I think we've looked at some of that in the past as far as class sizes and can a teacher, you know, teach different classes virtually and not run over the class size limitations for special ed kids. I think the other issue is just um, how much summer school are you going to run and who is going to be employed. I know I have some clients that have talked about having summer school for everybody this year and maybe not charging for it. And what they would do is, and this is in, in a client where they've looked at summer school costs, maybe do a week of math catch up, a week of English catch up, a week of catch up in um, US history or government or different by subject matters, just to get kids feeling more comfortable about this whole period of remote learning and 
feeling more comfortable to move into the next year. Yeah, um, and also, I mean, in terms of if you're doing it for credit, and I think what you're saying that some districts are doing is wonderful, you know, being able to really offer it to everybody. But for those who are still kind of doing it for the traditional reason of giving credit to, to these folks, ISB did recently put out new guidance around what it was going to be, and it really focused on kind of for high school credit in terms of having, you know, 60 hours um, for each credit given that was going to be counted. And the, the key there is that while the number is 60, they have expressly provided for as much flexibility locally as a district seemingly wants to with respect to how they're going to count that 60 hours. So it's everything from kind of if a teacher's recording themselves, if two kids are working together remotely, if a kid is doing work by themselves, if a teacher and a kid are checking in on one another, all of that is going to count um, with the you know, end goal of being getting that to that 60 hours um, as opposed to you know, being as strict about it as they typically would be. So that's in the recent guidance that came out. Yeah, and that's really important. And again, back to what we were talking about before and that dovetails, which is if you're giving incompletes in particular, this is the opportunity to try to, this is a, one of the opportunities. Certainly you can do it when the school year begins as well, but summer school is certainly an opportunity to try to get kids back on track, to master some of that content um, so that they can, they can move that to a pass or to a grade. Nikki, you and I just published an alert about a reminder from the U.S. Department of Education about work that schools should be doing now to revise their FERPA annual notice with remote learning in mind. Can you tell us, remind us, what is the FERPA annual notice and what should schools be planning on now? Right, we'll chalk this up into the list of all of the crazy requirements and things that you have to do. Um, and so I think this is an important one though, obviously, um, you know, it's what, what the annual FERPA notice is, is it's a requirement that you remind parents um, of your policy related to what you consider directory information. So we've talked about that before a little bit. Usually, you know, it's things like name and address, parent name, sometimes it's class, um, you know, class year, rank, um, and different districts um, have different directory, student directory information policies. It's just important that you review yours, make sure it's up to date, and most importantly, that it is consistent with the practice that your district has in terms of releasing information. Likewise, um, you are also supposed to notify parents of um, the types of, of ways that you share data under what we refer to as the school officials exception to FERPA. And this is when you share data with third parties to have them do things that otherwise the district would do. And this is sort of important right now because this is the exception that allows us to share data with third party education technology companies um, as one example. And so again, just making sure that your notice is up to date. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think that you are likely going to have extensive notices, you know, changes to your notices or to your policy. But I think one of the other reasons that the USDOE came out with this um, reminder, other, other than that it's an annual thing, is that we're using a lot of ed tech right now. Um, and we've talked about this in the past um, webinars, which is that this is a great way to keep students engaged and connected. But we do have to be careful that we, you know, FERPA, ISRA, our other student data privacy laws have not been suspended during this time. We have to make sure that we're complying with them and that we're taking into account student safety and student data privacy. So really important to look at your notices, but also important to keep thinking about those requirements. And do you think that districts are gonna to have to make a lot of changes in these notices and policies? You know, I, I don't think so. I think what, generally speaking, you know, they're, they're fairly standardized what are in those notices and policies, but if, you know, if, you should just be, become acquainted with what, for example, you list under directory information um, because it may be a very short list and you may have been sharing information um, that goes outside that boundary. So you just want to make sure that your practices are aligned with, with your policies. Okay, one of the most challenging issues schools have faced since the pandemic began has been dealing with the many labor and employment laws and rules and agreements uh, in making essential decisions about how to use human resources in this time. Shelly, Dana, Nikki, what are you seeing in this realm that our participants should know about as the year comes to an end? 
I guess I'll start. I mean, the biggest question that we're continuing to get, um, even as we you know, are a number of months into this, is how they go about continuing to pay employees who are either performing work, performing partial work, not performing work, um, or what they should think about kind of moving forward with respect to summer school and stipend and positions for next year. So those are really the questions. And, and I'll say the same thing I've said, you know, eight weeks now, that with respect to what we've got in front of us, that the, the joint statement that came out talks about payment as if school were functioning normally through the end of this year. Um, which means that you look at all the positions that someone might have, have had, whether it's a stipend position or your paras or maybe your security staff who aren't doing the same work they were doing before and continue to pay them the same way that you were paying them before um, through the end of the school year. And you know, we continue to get questions about stipends. And, and I'll say you know, one of the interesting questions that I recently received was related to you know, those school boards that may not have officially um, uh, hired or appointed their coaches for spring session yet, or we're going to do so in the March meet their March board meeting. They never got around to it. Since those people weren't actually hired, does the district have to pay those people? I think that was a really interesting question because it has a number of components to it. I think if you were looking technically at the language in the, the joint guidance, you could look at it two different ways. I and mean, in the one sense, without COVID, those individuals likely would have been hired. So then maybe you should have to pay them. But if you're also looking at the fact of, since they were not hired for those positions, does, is the board obligated to actually pay? Because typically the board wouldn't pay someone who had not hired. So you really have to kind of look at it very specifically and look at how many people you're talking about and the, the labor implications of that. Um, so there's a lot of pieces to that, but those are the questions that I tend to get. I, Nikki, I assume you're getting the same thing from the districts you work with? Yeah, absolutely. I had a question. What are, what are you seeing, Shelly, in terms of 12-month employees? So, so particularly, you know, your custodians, your secretaries, are we going to still need to pay them come summer? What's, what are we going to do there? Well, I think there, I mean, it really depends on, I would say, no, unless you still you know, need them for the work. And I think that for many cases, especially with our secretarial staff, there's probably a lot of work that will need to be done to get us back to some form of the next school year. Um, but not in terms of paying them for work that they're not actually uh, performing. I think that unless something comes out from, um, you know, a number of agencies working together again, um, saying that we have to continue to do so, I think we're going to see a lot of districts really looking at their budgets and determining what they need and only paying for the services that they actually need. And that's when I think, I, we're going to talk about RIFs also, but I mean, that's when I think you're going to see a lot of that. Right. And just to... Just to be clear, you're not saying that they can stop paying 12 month employees once, you know, June 1st comes. I mean, if people are under contract and they haven't been ripped, you're saying that if they're doing any extra duties, that that obligation ends with the um, end of the school year. But I think, you know, that that brings up the question of rifts and the 30 day um, notice requirement for rifts and really looking into next school year, looking into what you're going to need and making those decisions. And I know we've gotten a lot of questions, I think because of all the media attention to it, because it's not really something that we use in the school realm, but a lot of questions about furloughs. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, you know, it's really, it's interesting because I don't know about you guys, but furlough is not a word that we typically hear within the school environment. I, my, our understanding is that there's been some discussions among some groups about furlough. You know, I'd really like to sort of break that down a little bit. I don't know that that's an appropriate sort of process to use within with your with your support staff. You know, first of all, the concept of furlough is it, there's not really a legal definition to it. it. It means different things in different contexts. In terms of your support staff, if that's what we're looking at, you know, either you're going to, you know, we're really encouraging districts right now to take a, a very close look at what are their staffing needs going to be for the summer, what's plan A, what's plan B, and likewise for the fall. And then really, if you're looking at not needing, you know, a certain number of paraeducators or secretaries or the like, what we're really talking about there is riffing those. Um, as you know, unless your contract provides otherwise, um, you know, you can riff on 30 days notice. So that's something that you're going to really want to think about and plan out. Um, you can always, and of course, have an obligation to recall those folks should you need them. In terms of furlough, you know, some of the discussions that I've heard are, well, you could stop paying them, um, but they wouldn't be eligible for unemployment then 
and you'd avoid an unemployment claim, and that's just wrong. I mean, if you're not paying them, they are eligible for unemployment, regardless of whether you use the term furlough. The second piece of that is some, some folks have talked about, well, that would be, enable us to keep them on their, our health insurance. Well, I mean, that's a real question. You know, I think likely your health insurance would not allow you to, you know, to keep folks on the rolls that are not currently being paid. Um, and what you'd end up, if you promise that, is you know, either you couldn't do it or you're paying COBRA, which is obviously much more expensive. I guess the sort of the long and the short of it is, is that there's really not a concept of furlough. It probably doesn't exist within your CBA. It certainly doesn't exist within the school code. And really what we're thinking about when we're talking about support staff is, is riffing those that we don't need and hopefully recalling them, you know, when, when we're back up and running again. And it's, it's not practical. I think we need to think about it in that term too, is because if you hear about furlough in certain areas, this, these are people that are still getting their insurance. Your costs for support staff are insurance. You know, someone is making $15, $16 an hour, but receiving an insurance plan that the premium on it is $28,000 a year and maybe paying, you know, 10% of that. Um, so it's just not a practical solution for a school district to talk about furlough. Right. Um, it might and be possible for a private business that has employees that make a lot more money, um, but it's, it's not practical here. Yeah, and we had a question come in, and of course, the question was, can you recall mid-year? Yes, I mean, if you riff someone, um, if you riff your staff because we're still remote come fall, but then, you know, hopefully we move to, you know, whatever phase of the governor's plan allows us to reopen, you can recall those staff mid-year so you haven't lost that opportunity to get them back in your buildings. Yeah, I, mean, I think the concern that people have is, you know, well, if we let them go, they could go find other work, and therefore they won't be there, and maybe they're, you know, talented staff who work well with the kids, and, and that's the reality of the situation. The, the risk is that they are going to go out and find alternative work, and it won't be available for recall. I, I do want to just remind everyone, because it's probably been a long time since many of school districts out there have done major rifts of support staff, but, you know, please be mindful to look at your agreements as to how you categorize people, because the moving around of the different pieces of, you know, when you rift one person, where do they have the ability to bump from one place to another, and how that domino effect impacts kind of a number of different positions. You may have, you know, a secretary who can also be a uh, supports a, a paraprofessional and things like that. So if your collective bargaining agreement does not specifically identify specific categories, you're really going by seniority to determine um, RIFs, even if it is just a reduction in hours. Under the school code, that's still considered a RIF of that person's, you know, work time. So it's really an important process that you sit down, walk through, work through it, show it to your union so there's no fighting about it later and explain how you got there um, before you start having the board take action on that. Yep. Shelly, I know we talked about stipends a little bit. Um, did, you know, oftentimes we're sending out notices now for next year. Did you have any further thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the one piece about that is that, you know, many, not only do many collective bargaining agreements specify, you know, a certain date by which someone has to say, you know, you're not going to be in that stipend position for next year, um, but there's also just the general practice that if you've been in the stipend position one year, you're going to have it the next year. And I think because we don't have any guidance out right now, um, and, so, and hopefully there will not be, it's mandating that we continue to pay for work not performed. My recommendation has been that um, superintendents put out notice to their staff saying, in the event that we can hold these programs for kids next year, so you know whether it's virtually you find a way to do it or we're, we're back in school, you will have that type of position. However, if we are unable to hold that program or that activity, you will not be paid for that work. And I think that is something that the sooner you can get that out, the better to put people on notice of that. So although it's not directly COVID-19 related, uh, we wanted to at least raise the fact because it, it is important as you're planning for the end of the year that yesterday the U.S. Department of Education uh, finally released Title IX regulations. These were proposed back in November 2018 and it took almost a year and a half for us to get final regulations, but they did come out yesterday. Um, Jennifer and I have both been poring over the 2,000 plus pages in the um, notice of the final rules. So 
Uh, Jennifer, do you want to begin a, a little, give a little information about what's in there? Yeah, I, I mean, it's fascinating, first of all, that these actually came out. We've been anticipating them. Um, there have been, uh, there's been litigation to try to stop them. It's been a hallmark, it's, it's a centerpiece of Betsy DeVos's agenda. And um, there, there was just considerable question whether they would really come out in light of all the circumstance, because it, it applies to both K-12 and higher ed, although uh, different components are going to apply differently. There's different requirements depending on um, which type of school you are. So that, that's more of a departure even than I think in prior, uh, in prior regulations. It is going to require everyone to review and update policies. Um, it's effective this August. So we're still fully digesting the terms, but I think it impacts your, it, Im it impacts the, investiga the investigation, who does it, how they do it, the determination process, who can make determinations, um, conflict, uh, you know, and as far as managing conflicts uh, from, from one position, such as a Title IX coordinator, can they make other types of determinations. It um, talks about timing of determinations. Um, I think in K-12, we have so many overlapping laws when, um, when a student's bullied, for example. You have state law that addresses how to do a bullying investigation. You have uh, your code of conduct. So sometimes um, Title IX is not the first thing we think of, but these requirements are so specific that we really need to integrate them into just our normal practice when sex-based discrimination uh, harassment is involved. So it, it is an unfortunate time because it's not like everyone's plates aren't full with a pandemic, but um, it, it's something that we need to come up with some bandwidth on because um, you know, I think in some ways it's going to lessen, it, it clarifies obligations and it might lessen legal risk to some degree. I think um, these rules are perhaps more clear about um, the parameters and what's your responsibility as opposed to, you know, outside responsibility. Jackie, I don't know, what was your take on just the initial read? I agree with you that I think in the end, this is likely to make it less common for school districts to be found in violation of Title IX by the Office for Civil Rights or OCR. I do think that's true. Unfortunately, to get to that point, it's going to take a significant amount of work, a lot of which has to occur starting right now and into the summer um, because of that August 14th implementation date. We're actually gonna be having a complimentary webinar on Monday that myself and Amy Dickerson and Emily Tullock, who the three of us are the authors of our Title IX Insights blog, we're gonna be having a breakdown of what the changes are. We're gonna be bringing more programming to you as well as policies, forms. There's a ton of forms that are gonna be required by this. So again, um, it's just something to keep an eye on and, and please do join us on Monday if you're a, in any way connected with Title IX in your district. Um, I mean, Jackie, it might be a good time to remind people Title IX applies not just to students, it applies to employees. It's very broad in um, its protection. Really anything having to do with sex-based discrimination, um, Title IX has an implication. So it, it touches on many more positions than how we sometimes silo different issues. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's jump in and answer some of the questions we've received. So one question is, in wrapping up this year, we expect that our current year, fiscal year 1920, results from operations will be skewed. But we are not sure by how much or which funds might be most affected. Do we need to amend our budget before year end? And what do we do if we are not sure what the amended amount should be? Can we just explain any variances through our management discussion and analysis section of our audited financial statements after our audit is complete? Nikki, do you have thoughts on that one? Sure, and my, you know, my knowledge, of, I, I, I know enough, just enough about budgeting to be dangerous here, but um, you know, for a material change in the budget, we would recommend that um, that you that you do a budget amendment. I understand that there might be some uncertainties around that. Just remember that a budget amendment has to be posted for 30 days before board action. 
Um, we would also recommend that at this point you consult with your auditor about what constitutes a material change, what you would have to do an amendment for, and whether that change can be addressed in the MD&A section of the audit. Um, they would really be your first go-to in confirming that that's the correct place for it. Great. Shelly, if an employee comes into one of the buildings, we have them submit a school oh. work order describing yes, they where they've been so the custodians can focus on those areas. Do you have any this thoughts on that? Yeah, this wasn't as much of a question. I just noted it um, because I thought it was great. and I wanted the rest of our, our attendees to be able to hear that. But I love this idea of kind of having a specific type of work order. And that really does help the someone doesn't have to try to remember where they've been, but that they can actually have written down, like these are the areas that I'm, I'm going into, so you know where you have to clean if, if something ultimately happens and someone tests positive, so. That's great. Uh, Dana, can you share which policy may address the graduation requirement of the Constitution test? Is it a student policy or an instruction policy? I think people are asking where this is in the IASB policies, and frankly, I'm not sure if it's in there. It is a legal requirement. Um, and I think it's under, it's in the 27, Article 27 of the school code someplace, <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, it would probably be an instruction um, under, our, under the seven section rather than, um, or the student section. It's, I think it's um, in section six actually. Six is instruction, yeah. seven yeah. is students. It's, it's, it may not be a policy, it's a legal requirement. So I don't know if they'd also write a corresponding policy. Yeah, most boards that I've worked on this issue with, and I've done a few of them actually in the last month, a few weeks rather, um, that we, they do have actually board policies that track what the state requirements are. And that's kind of what I was referring to, is making sure that you amend that or suspend it for this year. I think it's, if I look at it, I think it's like six, colon 300, um, that you suspend that so that it actually is can comply with the new state law, so. Yeah, we actually just got a comment in the chat, 63100, so. Oh, all right, there we go. Good job. <laughs> Good memory. Um, okay, Nikki, any comments about districts providing PPE and asking or highly encouraging staff to do a home visit? A ding-dong ditch method of reaching out to those attendance issue students. Okay, so this I think related back to sort of our concerns about attendance and truancy. Um, I, I think at this point um, we are, you know, we would not recommend that you start to do home visits. I, you know, I, I think we don't want to put staff in a position where they're visiting folks at home that I think really is going outside the bounds of uh, the governor's order a bit. And I, I think I would just be concerned about that even if you had PBE. Um, I think we should continue to try our remote ways. Obviously phone calls being the sort of, I think most impactful if you aren't feeling, you know, you aren't hearing from folks. Dana, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I just I, really I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's a, a good practice right now. I think if someone is not responding to you, your phone calls and your and your electron, your emails, then you don't want to go to their house. I think that almost puts staff maybe in a uncomfortable or dangerous situation. You know, I do think this is interesting though, because I do, I am starting to hear, I did hear on the news in states where things have been relaxed, they have sent special ed teachers with PPE into people's homes. They have had kids come uh, even though the building is closed to receive one-on-one -on -one services and Montana is opening some schools today and that's there there's two reasons they're opening or there's two instances where they're letting people in one is for special ed one-to-one -one, and one is for kids that don't understand their e-work they can make an appointment with a teacher um, so this might be something that we're looking at again if we're looking at continued distance learning and a slow reopen there are many issues. So even when schools are open and you have to do homebound services, when you send um, employees into the home, I mean, often we try to do that at libraries or other public places. When you're literally sending employees into the home, right. there are a number of safety issues. We've had allegations of misconduct that are very hard to refute. So sometimes I, uh, in difficult situations, I've required two stat co-treaters, mm -hmm. and obviously that um, hurts the social distancing component or makes that more complicated, but this really needs to be thought out before 
we and once we say yes it will be a slippery slope we've already had requests for this and so far the position has been we're not doing any in person and that's not our choice that's based on the state requirements we need a more thoughtful plan on a number of components before we agree to any any face to face absolutely we're at one o'clock, but we're gonna answer these last questions. So please stick around. Uh, we, I see quite a few of you still on, so we'll, we'll work through these. We did get a question about whether we'd be sending information about Monday's Title IX webinar. And um, we did include it in an alert yesterday about the Title IX regulations. So um, check back for that again, but we'll also send one, I believe either today or tomorrow, just with the webinar information. Uh, Shelly, we also got a question. We weren't able to complete our support staff evaluations for parapros. How would we categorize our support staff? So I think that that is two different parts of the question. So in terms of, you know, whether or not you're able to complete the support staff evaluation, I think you have to look at your collective bargaining agreement and see what you have to do with respect to that component of evaluating performance. And that's part of it. And make an arrangement with the union as to, you know, similar how we talked about teachers in, in the past few weeks, in terms of, you know, are there different components that have already been completed, you only have another component that you need to complete, or if you just hold off and doing it until next year. When I was talking about categories of support staff, I was referring to if you have, for instance, a support staff unit that contains secretaries, it contains paraprofessionals, it contains the bookkeeper, and a number of other people who we just consider generally educational support staff. Typically when you do a RIF, you have to RIF by category, and that's what I was referring to, which really is not, in, it's not related to performance the same way the groupings are that are related to performance for teachers. So I don't know if those two different issues are maybe getting confused there, but that's what I was referring to with respect to the categorization. So we received the question, have there been any updates to driver education behind the wheel time for students who had currently been taking this course? As far as I know, there has not been any updates. I know that there's been some, some that they're looking to try to figure out some of the classroom. Um, but at this point, I haven't seen anything new on the behind the wheel section. Um, so I think we are, you know, I think in terms of the classroom sections, that's been a little bit different. Um, in terms of the behind the wheel, um, I, you know, we're still looking for ISBs, you know, any updated guidance on that, but we haven't seen much so far. Do you know if there are any proposed changes to physical and immunization requirements? Schools are registering now for August and families can't get into physicians to take care of these requirements. You know, I'll tell you, I don't, I'm not aware of any specific changes that there, there are to those requirements. That being said, however, I do know that the doctors um, are actually still completing um, regular visits for kids. Um, so I think that there might just be a matter of whether or not your particular doctor is still, still seeing kids. And, and I think there are resources out there, though, that will be able to get that done so that you're able to, to get the information completed. And I think that schools need to be flexible if they can't get the information to you until July to, to continue with all the registration except for that one component of it until then. Okay, we did receive a comment that some recent ISBE guidance does refer to doing home visits if a student is missing. I think even with that, uh, hopefully folks will keep in mind the, the risks that are associated with that and, and hopefully work with counsel to try to mitigate any of those concerns before uh, doing those home visits. That was our last question. I'd like to thank our panelists and also thank all of you for joining us. We will be back next week where we will start turning to what you can do during your summer uh, to prepare for next year. So please send us our questions to allmarketingatfransic.com if you have any that you'd like us to discuss. And otherwise, we'll see you all next week. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Thank you.